So good morning once again, everybody. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. All right, that's a little bit better. Uh, So guys, we are uh, in part two of a series that we started last month because we haven't been in church together for a few weeks. Uh, And we are doing a series called Adult VBS. So what we wanted to do, we, uh, our, our staff, in one of our staff meetings, we were talking about how a lot of churches do at the movies during the summer, and it can be kind of shallow, you know, I've done it before, the series, uh, different movies, but um, as we were talking, we came to the conclusion that most modern Christians, because we live in such a postmodern, post-Christian society, most Christians really aren't totally familiar with the great Bible characters, the heroes of the faith. And so uh, we decided to do a series called Adult VBS. And so today I'm going to be looking at Abraham. Uh, And I think, I don't know if, is Rhonda? Okay. We we had something prepared for for you guys for... uh, have you guys ever heard of Father Abraham and ever did it in kids' church? All right. Well, she and the kids were going to do Father Abraham, but I think she, she got lost in Kidsville. So. Uh, so anyway, guys, if you want to take out your outlines and something to write with, and I'm going to pray and we're going to dive into Mark 10. Father, thank you again, Lord, just for your anointing, God, upon the truth. Lord, I pray that as a vessel, Father, a vessel for you to speak through by your Spirit, God, that you would give me the words to say today. Father, the right words, Lord, that are going to be spoken in a right spirit, Father, that will have effect in the hearts of my brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you again for this privilege. I don't take it lightly. And Lord, again, we just thank you, God, for all you're doing and are going to do. In Jesus' name, again, everybody said amen. Amen. All right, so Mark chapter 10. This is kind of the verse that we're theming our series off of, uh, of adult VBS Vacation Bible Schools. It says, when Jesus saw what was happening, so what was happening? Jesus' disciples were pushing the little kids away from Jesus. So they were probably trying to get him off, get the kids off of his knee and, you know, kind of protecting him from the little kids. So when Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, and if you want to write this down in your first blank, he is saying that God the Father is looking for simple childlike faith. You know, if you want to write in your margin for for home study, John chapter 3. You know, in John chapter 3, a religious ruler by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night so he won't be seen, and, you know, because he doesn't want to ruin his reputation. And so, basically, that's the first thing, is people who are afraid of their reputation or what people will think don't, Jesus, they can't come to Jesus, because you cannot come with pride. And so, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night so he's not going to be seen, And he asked the question, good teacher, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus basically says, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, unless you are born of the Spirit, you cannot, everybody say cannot, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God. So what Jesus is referring to here with his disciples is the same thing he was referring to with Nicodemus. Basically, it takes simple childlike faith to enter into the kingdom of God. And so, with that, guys, what we're going to talk about today is 
uh, Abraham, who is known as the father of those who believe, as the father of faith. You'll see there on your outline, we see that story of Abraham that we're going to look at. From Genesis 11, we first see Abraham all the way through his death in Genesis 25. Needless to say, I am not going to read all of that scripture. It's a lot. But I want to give you some high points uh, from the life of Abraham. And then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what faith really is out of Abraham's life. So the first thing I want to show you is that Abraham was born in 25 or 2150 B.C. in Ur, Ur, Ur sounds like a burp, Ur, sorry, in Ur of the Chaldees. Weird name and place, but let me show you where it's at. It's very interesting. Uh, so this is right here. You guys remember in Genesis 1 through 3 where it says the Garden of Eden was where the Tigris River, the Euphrates, and the Pishon River came together right here. So we know that the Garden of Eden, the beginning of mankind, was right in this area that is right north of the, I think that's the Sea of Kuwait, I believe. So Abraham, this is pretty much the first of civilization of mankind. From Adam and Eve, you know, People started moving this way, and they built Ur, and then Uruk. <laughs> kind of weird. Where do you live? Ur. Where do you live? Uruk. Anyway, sorry. It's the redneck in me that had to come out. So Abraham was living there with his family, his father, who we're going to see in a few moments, Terah. And Abraham had, had two other brothers that we're going to see in a little while as well. Anyway, so this is where our story centers, and then it moves up here to Haran, then finally down to the promised land that God promised Abraham and his descendants. And so second, so he was born in 2150 in Ur of the Chaldees. Next, he moved to Haran with his father. So I don't know, we don't need to put it up right now. He moved to Haran with his father, Terah, who had been an idol maker, as well as with his nephew Lot. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. At God's call, Abraham traveled to Canaan, Canaan and lived for a while in different localities, various localities. In particular, Shechem, Hebron, Bethel, and the Negev Desert. Abraham led a band of armed men to rescue his nephew Lot from kings who had captured him, interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember Lot's wicked residence. He paid tithes to Melchizedek, uh, and he did that as a, as a way of honor, and he's the first one we see in the Bible, tithing. He uh, paid tithes to Melchizedek, to the king of Salem, and he entertained angels. Uh, if you remember when the angels came announcing uh, the birth of his one-day son. He bore a son, Ishmael, by his wife's servant, who became the father of the Arab nations. His heir, Isaac, was born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age by supernatural intervention by God. So he is the father of of all the Jewish peoples, as well as, as we'll see, all believers. So Abraham's devotion to God was such that he was willing to sacrifice his only son. So the only son that, that God had promised him, Isaac, he was willing to sacrifice to show his devotion to God above that of his son. He is no, thereby known as the father of all believers. And so, again, if you want to study the whole life of Abraham and of, of his faith, you know, you've got those 12 chapters, Genesis 11 through 25, and there's really interesting chapters. But hopefully, I'm going to be able to hit a few of the high tops here as we talk about what faith is. So, what is faith? Faith is one of those words like love that can be kind of hard to define. You know, like love is faith a feeling. Well, 
as we'll see, faith isn't really just a feeling. It can include a feeling, but it's something more than a feeling, okay? Hebrews 11, verse 1 and 2 tells us what faith is. It says there, and this is the hall of faith. This is where we read about all these great heroes of the faith. It says that now faith is, everybody say and circle the word confidence. Say it again, confidence. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance, underline and circle that and say assurance, and the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And it goes through from verse 2 all the way through verse 13, some of the ancients who had deeds of faith that showed that they believed God and that they had an assurance and a confidence that, that goes beyond this world to believe in the God who is invisible, to have confidence in the God who cannot be seen. So we see that with these great giants of the faith. And it says here in verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They what? Everybody say did not. They did not receive the things promised to them. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on this earth. And let me just stop and ask you, are you a foreigner on this earth? As believers, we are called to walk as those who have not homesteaded in this world. I fear that too many of God's people have put such deep roots into this world that they, they're not truly strangers, you know, as it says here of Abraham, you know, foreigners, aliens. But these people, they admitted that they were foreigners and strangers on this earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, if you want to read about the city, the New Jerusalem, Put in your homework, uh, write down Revelation chapter 22. Chapter 22 describes in great detail the new Jerusalem and the city of God that's going to come down from heaven and be the capital of a renewed, recreated world. But these people, they were believing before they were seeing. And so, you know, that's a, the biggest part of faith is the knowing, write this down, knowing within your knower that you know. <laughs> knowing in your knower, your knower is your spirit. Knowing in your knower that you know that you know. And so it goes beyond, you, you know, you just know, listen, somebody could put a, a, a rifle to my head and tell me, confess that God is not real. You know what? I'm dead. Because bottom line is, I know that I know that I know who my Redeemer is. And I know that He lives. I've seen Him operate in my life too many times. How could I ever doubt the God who saved me, who forgave me, who gave me hope, gave me a future? Never could I ever deny Him. So going further... So faith is, again, we're talking about this fact that faith is seeing or believing before seeing. Romans 4, look at Romans 4, verses 16 through 21. It says there, as we go deeper into what faith is, it says, For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the Scriptures mean when God told him, 
I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God, underline this, who, and say it with me, brings dead things back to life. Let's say it again, brings the dead back to life. So God is the God who can bring things in your life that were dead. He has the ability to bring them back to life. And he also has the ability, underline and say this, to create new things out of nothing. He can create where there is nothing, he can create something. I'm going to give you, before I read on, I'm going to give you an example of a promise that the Lord gave me back in 2009. Most of you know my story. Uh, I had been married for almost 25 years. Got married very young. Um, you know, it was never an easy marriage, but, you know, we loved Jesus and, you know, had three wonderful kids. But in 2009, I felt like the Lord gave me a promise out of Isaiah 55, 13. I think we have it. There it is. And every year, I read my Bible through once a year. So on the, in the margin of Isaiah 55, 13, I wrote uh, 2009, next year, 2010. Every time I read it, I stood before God for my marriage, okay? And so I would claim and pray, Father, you said... Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will go grow. In other words, thorns represent hardship. It, re it represents, you know, things that hurt and hurting each other. Cypress trees are strength, symbolize strength. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, which we know on the beach, there's little stupid things that get all over in your legs. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. Myrtles have a wonderful scent. They're, they're, they're just beautiful and sweet smelling. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. Guys, like I said, 2009, 2010 in my margin, 2011, still standing on this promise, 2012, 2013. We had been separated from 2010. So, 2014. And I'm, by this year, at the five-year mark, I'm thinking, man, Lord, when is this going to come to pass? Well, I had stood for my marriage, but how many of you know it takes two to make a marriage, one to break it? And so, you know, the disappointment of my life I, I had never thought I would be a statistic, be one of the divorce statistics, but there I was in 2014, uh, after four years of separation, waiting on God, I was one of the statistics that I had years before <clears throat> had really condemned. Needless to say, I had to repent when I really realized that, you know, sometimes it's not a, a person's uh, fault. People are going to do what they want to do. You know, and here, that's my big revelation in life, is people are going to do what they want to do, ultimately. Well, I'm still holding this promise, and come July of 2014, I went to a, uh, God forbid, a, Fe a Peter Frampton Doobie Brothers concert. So, I went to a Peter Frampton Doobie Brothers concert in New Orleans, and the pastor uh, and his wife, who are my closest friends who I was with, she leans over to me uh, during the concert, and she's just crying. And she says, the Lord gave me a word for you. And basically the word was that he was going to bring someone who would fully understand me and that I would fully understand them, and that it would be something that would be strong and unbreakable. Uh, and it's because I had, had stood and honored God in standing. And so literally the next uh, September, this would be September, mid-September, I'm reading this again, and I write down 2014, and all of a sudden it dawns on me, and I wrote Rob, because I just met Robin, like literally three weeks before, and I wrote Robin? Question mark. And you know what, guys? Here's the deal. Sometimes, you know, Abraham thought the promise that God gave him was going to be for Ishmael. 
But it wasn't. The promise was for, for Isaac. And so, you know, a promise for, from God may be for something different than what you are thinking it's going to be about. And so, uh, going on, so let's, let's, let's read. I love this again. Because listen, here's what I want you to get. Did God have power to resurrect the marriage? Yes. Absolutely. He is the God who, everybody say it with me, brings the dead back to life. But sometimes things die. People die. Our dear Laura died yesterday, and we've been praying for her. So what does God do? He has the ability to bring dead things back to life, but he also creates, everybody say new things. New things out of nothing. Only God can do that. And I am so in love with my wife, Robin. We're going on, what, seven years of marriage soon here? And I just thank God every day that uh, out, of, out of pain, where there was pain, you know, cypress trees, strength. Our marriage is a strong marriage. Myrtles of softness. There's a lot of tenderness in our marriage every single day. She asked me, have I told you today how much I love you? And I said, well, I don't remember. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> but God is good, folks, all the time. So, continuing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept on hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. The sand on the seashore. And Abraham's faith, it did not weaken. Even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his wrinkled old body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Everybody say fully convinced. He was, and underline it, fully convinced that God is what? Able to do whatever he promises. So first of all, and i got to move on here, faith is believing before actually seeing. As we saw in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it's that confidence, the assurance that we have that God indeed is fully able to accomplish what he's promised us. Second thing we learn from Abraham about faith is not only is faith believing before seeing, but faith is acting before understanding. Let me say that again. Faith is acting before understanding. Listen to this in Hebrews 11. Again, the Hall, the hall of Faith chapter. Verse 8. It says there, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Let me, let's say that together. He went without knowing where he was going. And so usually, folks, how this works, and it's how it's worked in my own life, is it starts... Faith will start with a sense of unsettledness in where you are presently in your life. And you can't explain it, but there's just something stirring. There's an unsettledness. You know, back when I uh, came to Pensacola for Bible college so many years ago, I lived in Lafayette, Louisiana, Cajun country. All of my friends were in Lafayette. But something, I had become a Christian my freshman year of college. Something was stirring in me. My friends, I was leading them to the Lord one by one by one by one. But in my, in my I was in, a, I was, uh, in a geology, 
because everything there is around oil. In my <clears throat> geology class, I would have a, a Christian booklet in, or the Bible in between the pages, and I was just so hungry for God's Word. I was just ravenous, like, like a newborn babe, the Bible says. But, you know, something was stirring, stirring, and finally I went to my pastor and I said, I don't know what this is, but I feel like I've, I've got to move. I've got to, go, I got to go to Bible college somewhere. I don't even, I just know somehow God's called me to ministry. Well, lo and behold, two months later, I packed up everything, left my family, left my friends, left every single thing I knew, and drove my little 1982 rusted Honda Accord uh, to Pensacola. And you know, I'll never forget coming to Pensacola and just wondering, like, God, why am I here? What am I doing here? But this is the exact same thing that Abraham did. So I want you to see this, you know, again, because that thing, and write this down, the biggest enemy of faith is comfort. And so that willingness of Abraham to leave the comfort of his family back in Ur of the Chaldees, you know, so he leaves and with his father, ironically, and he goes, it says, to the, he didn't know where he was going. <laughs> he, hey, how many of you guys ever felt that in life that, where the heck am I? Where in the world am I going? What's going on in my life here? Abraham had no idea. So, we got to move on. So, faith is, first of all, believing before, everybody say, believing before seeing. It is acting before understanding. And then number three, and this is a big one, guys. Faith is a family affair. I want, I want to show you this in Abraham's lineage, okay? So, going back to Genesis 11, it says there that this is the account of Terah's family. So, faith really started with Abraham's father, Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So, three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran, listen to this, died in Ur of the Chaldees, the land of his birth, while his father, Terah, was still living. Now listen to verse 31. One day, Terah took his son, Abram, his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son, Abram's wife, and his grandson, Lot, which was his, brother, his son, Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldees. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. Let's put up our map real quick for point of reference. I think I got it. So, again, we've got the Garden of Eden, the birth of civilization right here where these rivers meet. We've got Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham and his father and his family are from <coughs> here in Ur. So, we think it's, <coughs> how many of you, have, sorry, the call. how many of you guys have thought that Abraham was the one who left everything and that he was the first one? Most Christians think that it was Abraham, but no, it was Terah, his father. So, he, they went and they settled in Haran. So, Terah died here. And one day, God has to speak to Abraham again and say, basically, go that way. That's where it says he didn't know where he was going, but he ended up here. Now, here's what I want you to get about Haran. How many of you guys have ever had, some of you may be too young, how many of you have, have ever had something that was so painful emotionally? It might be the death of someone, a parent, someone close to you but you found it almost impossible to move on. It just, it hit your faith in such a way that it was just, 
man, it was, it was crippling. And I, I'll tell you, folks, I know a lot of Christians who are on the sidelines because of something that happened. It might have been a church split. It might have been an abusive situation, a parent that was abusive. Uh, it could be any number of things, but that wound hit so hard that it sidelined you. It took the breath out of your spiritual wings, so to speak. Well, that's what obviously happened to Terah. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that his son, Haran, has the same name as the town he moves to? In other words, Terah couldn't make it past the death of his son. His son, Haran, that was as far as he could go. But it doesn't mean that God rejected him. And this is what I want you guys to see, is that God is a God who is for family salvation. I want you to look at Acts 16, okay, verse 31. I've stood on this promise from my family for now 30 plus years. And, you know, I will, this is a promise that I will stand on until Jesus comes back. But Acts 16, 31 says, the Philippian jailer is, you know, an earthquake hits. Paul and Silas are in, in prison. An earthquake shakes the place and the doors all open. And the, the Philippian jailer is about to kill all the prisoners. And Paul says, stop, stop, stop. And the guy says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He gets on his knees. And the, Paul and Silas replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And I want you to say it out of your own mouth, along with everyone in your household. Let's say it again. Along with everyone in your household. You know, as I said earlier in the service, many of us light a candle for those hard people, those hard cases, you know, that we've been praying for and praying for and praying for. And let me just tell you, you know, I prayed for my dad for 25 years. He gave his life to Christ four years before he died. And on, on his deathbed, he thanked me. He was Roman Catholic his whole life. And he thanked me for leading him to Christ. My mother, I prayed for the same amount of time. I led her in a personal little Bible study to receive Christ. I know my mom and dad are in heaven and going to, when I get there, I know that they're going to be on my welcoming committee. But I still have a sister left. You know, how many of you guys have that one straggler that just seems to hang on, man? But I've been praying now for 30 plus years for her. And I'll tell you guys, it can be very discouraging. You know, I mean, very discouraging. She did prison time, you name it. But the end is not yet. And so bottom line is every Sunday, I'm going to light a candle for my sister. And I invite you guys, listen, again, I hope this is in, it encourages you to, to begin again to believe God, to believe God for those people in your life that don't yet know Christ. You know, some of you, we're going to pray at the end of this service, you need a resurrection of, of, of faith to believe again. And you know, I'll tell you, a, a, a lot of times my only prayer is, Father, remember blank, my sister's name. Lord, remember her, save her. I lay claim, I lay claim in her heart to the kingdom of God and that she will serve you, Lord. So, everybody say salvation, faith, is a family affair. So what have we learned so far? We're almost at the end. So we've learned that faith is believing before seeing. Faith is acting before understanding. Faith is a family affair. And fourth, faith is not perfect. It's not perfect. Let me just say, as a teenage Roman Catholic boy, I had friends who were Christians, and, you know, I, they were kind of friends because I partied and they didn't, but, but I would look at them and go, you know, I love Jesus, but man, I don't want to be like his followers. You know, it's like they're goody two-shoes. They're just gee whiz. They're no fun whatsoever. 
But, but Jesus I get, but Christians I don't get. And I can say to this day, a lot of Christians I still don't get. I just kind of like, Lord, I, I'm glad that you're so patient with your people, including me. Well, you know, it can be just such a numbskull. But anyway, everybody say faith is not perfect. So, Genesis 12, this is a parenthetical, are you guys getting something? Good, there's a lot, we're gonna, we've got about half our people out, and uh, hopefully each week they're going to be coming back in, amen? amen? If you're watching on live stream, come home, come home, the doors are open, that sound like, uh, what is it, the force be with you? Come home, Luke. Anyway, faith is not perfect, so Genesis 12 Genesis 12 is an interesting parenthetical chapter in Abraham's life. And just like David, none of the the heroes of faith, except for one, Joseph, has a perfect record. They're all flawed. I want you to say, I'm flawed. Okay? So Genesis 12, verse 10 says, Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe in Canaan. As he was about to enter Egypt, he told his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say you're my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Uh, As you can tell, he's putting his wife before himself. Just a joke. (laughs) When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was very beautiful, a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. I can imagine Pharaoh, you got to see her. She's so hot. You know, anyway. They praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. Pharaoh treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham, or Abram, acquired sheep and cattle, mule and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham and said, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? So Abraham actually let his wife sleep with Pharaoh. I mean, does this sound like a man of God and a man of faith? Anybody help me here? <laughs> but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham and said, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they went or they sent him on his way with his wife, with everything he had. So again, guys, we see here, and here's what's interesting. If you're a student of the Bible, this is a family sin, okay? Uh, we, call, we call it in the church world uh, uh, sins, generational sins. There's sins that are passed on from generations. And so we see this sin with Abraham. Then guess what? We see the same exact thing with Isaac, his son. I mean, the wording is almost exactly the same. That sin moved down through to the next generation. Guys, let me encourage you. We're t- today we're, t- some, we're talking about faith for our families. Listen, you need, if you have not had generational cleansing from family sins, sins of the, uh, of an, that you've inherited, propensities, it might be alcohol, a propensity toward addiction, you know, it could be a propensity toward anything you can think of, but if you look in your family tree, 
you're going to see some things if you've never done that. I call it spiritual mapping. How many of you guys have ever done spiritual mapping? Listen, a lot of you haven't. It's important, man, because a lot of times people struggle with things their whole Christian life, and they don't know why they're struggling. And what needs to happen is they need to verbally, uh, uh, out loud say, I renounce in the name of Jesus the bloodline tie of alcoholism. I renounce in the name of Jesus the, the tie to cancer. You know, my mom, my grandma, my grandmom's mom might have had cancer, but in Jesus' name, how many of you guys remember Gandalf saying, it shall not pass? Everybody say, it shall not pass. It shall not pass. So that's what some of you guys need to do, is you need to have a shall not pass moment over things that want to go in, into you generationally, and then eventually into your children, just like we see with Abraham with his son. So, moving on. So, first, and I know we're, we've done a lot of review, the first thing is faith is believing before seeing. Second, faith is acting before understanding. Third, faith is a family affair. Fourth, faith is not perfect, as we see with Abraham. And write this down, well, I don't think this is a blank, but... Religion equals do, Christianity equals done. I put that there because so many people think that I've got to live a perfect life as a Christian to be accepted by God. No. Guess what? Only one man, only one human lived a perfect life, and you're not it. It's Jesus. So we look to what Jesus has done at the cross and away from ourselves. Religion is through self-effort trying to please God and be right with God through self-effort. No, Christianity says done. Well, religion says you got to do more, you got to do more, you got to read your Bible more, you got to do this, you got to do that. Christianity says no, it's already been done. Get it? Okay, when I say get it, you say, and I say good, and we move on. All right, so finally, finally, fifth, faith is persevering to the very end. Faith is persevering to the end. I love this verse. This is Abraham's epitaph. Even though he was, had lied, had subjected his wife to the equivalent of prostitution, it says of Abraham, the last thing spoken over him, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. He finished his course. God had given him a race, and he, he completed his race. Look what Paul says. Speaking to his young disciple Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. He knows he's about to die by the sword, being beheaded. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know, uh, at the beginning of this service, I announced our dear Laura yesterday going on to be with the Lord. And, you know, I was like, Lord, what should I, should I keep my message that I had planned three weeks ago? And I started thinking about it, and I felt the Lord saying, absolutely, you prepared it for such a time as this. And I just want to say, guys, you know, uh, and if we could, one last time, put our pictures up there, Jimmy. Uh, put, a, put up the one of the baptism pictures. This is one of my favorites. So Laura came to us right after we had started the bridge. And we had a dinner for six at my home, Robin's in my home. And Laura was one of uh, the ones we had, inv had invited. And, uh, you know... She, if, to know Laura, 
is to know a soul who was truly joyous. She's from New Orleans. She was loud. You know, uh, I asked her as we went around the table, I said, so, <clears throat> Laura, what's your story? And she said, well, basically, um, I'm, uh, I'm th- uh, two weeks clean. I said, really? She said, yeah, I'm, uh, I've been a crack addict. And I'm like, okay, well, so we led her to the Lord. She renounced all those things out of her life. And not that she didn't struggle, but I'll tell you guys, in all of my ministry years, I have never seen a person come to faith and, and with everything within themselves tackle and take it. Laura wanted to grow. She was always, our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Laura pursued it. Man, and I'll, the last real conversation I had with her, you know, was probably uh, a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. But uh, I said, girl, I said, how are you doing? And uh, I said, you, you've gone back to New Orleans, any time to get, get, to get us some Cajun food? And, you know, she laughed as only she could laugh, and uh, a hearty laugh. And uh, I said, how are you doing? And she said, Pastor Bobby, I'm tired. I said, what do you mean? She said, you know, I just think about heaven, and I think about Jesus, and I just think about, man, you know, what it's going to be like to be able to rest from all of our labors, to be able to just fall into his arms, to, you know, I, she said, I just can't wait for the Lord to return, as crazy as this world has become. And you know, guys, that's what, like Paul, you know, Paul said, there's a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award on that day, not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. And you know, I don't know about you, but you know, there's a part of me that is jealous. There's a part of me that, you know, I think, man, she doesn't have to worry about bills every week. She doesn't have to worry about a job. She was getting a new job, you know, and, you know, just all the strains of life. She's with the one her heart yearned for. And I just want to challenge you. Do you long for the return of Christ? You know, we don't hear enough about that. In the world we live in right now, we should be as Christians more than ever sharing with people that Jesus is the promise of God is yes and amen. And when he said that his son, he's going to send his, re- his son to return to this earth and to rule and reign from a renewed Jerusalem on a renewed earth, God is not a man that he should lie. And you can take it to the bank that our Lord Jesus is coming back soon. Can I get an amen? amen. So as we finish here, I want you to write this down in this last blank. How do we make it and persevere to the end? By keeping our eyes on Jesus alone. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, Laura is now one of those witnesses watching, cheering us on, to the life of faith, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Each of one of us has a unique race that God has called us to. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And so, folks, you know, I was, Robin and I were listening to a podcast called the, I think it was called The Death of Mars Hill. Mars Hill uh, was one of the biggest churches in the United States up till five years ago. They had 15 campuses and over 15,000 people up in Seattle. And literally, <coughs> the, the senior pastor stepped down, and within literally two weeks, 
the whole thing shut down. Every single one of those churches shut down, no more people. Tons of people now, like I said, disillusioned, you know, leaving the faith. And you know, how, you know, you wonder, how can that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. By getting your eyes off Jesus. Everybody else can disappoint you and will probably disappoint you. I tell people, hang, hang around long enough and I'm going to offend you. I don't know how. I don't want to. It's just being human. That's what happens. But not Jesus. Jesus is always trustworthy. We can always trust him.